Now, let's prepare our hearts as we step into the Word and learn how we can be a community living new life in Jesus, loving God, connecting together, and living on mission in our world. Well, good morning. If you would, grab your Bibles and open up to a couple places. Um, the Gospel of John and the epistle written to the Christians in Philippi. John chapter 3 and then Philippians chapter 2. We may make our way over to Matthew and then to Luke and then we may be everywhere. But we'll start there. We're going to start in John chapter 3 this morning. And on your seat or around your seat or near your seat or close to your seat, I, I printed out what I would call my teaching notes for today. You say, wow, you really prepare every Sunday really well. You say, well, this is more of a, a visual representation of what we're talking about over the last three weeks and concluding with today. So that little flyer that you have on your seat, if you look at the back page, that's today's teaching. Today we're going to consider our, our fourth and final message in our vision, mission, values. What we really f believe God's called us to be all about. And, and that's on the very front. I mean, we're all about new life in Jesus. And maybe you can get the subliminal message there. This area has always been about new life in Jesus. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. In fact, it was the first place in America that was all about new life in Jesus. The cross on, the, on Pensacola Beach marks the first religious service in America. You live in an area that is unique. And it has always been about this simple dream. I want to see it done. As you move to the second page, you get a little bit of our story. And that's something that Pastor John and I shared briefly over the last couple of weeks. But you get a clear sense of what this is. Well, what is Coastline? What, what are you all about? Well, it's an autonomous, independent, collaborative family of churches united to see new life in Jesus all along our coastline by loving God connecting together, and living on mission in our world. Today, we'll consider the last part of that sentence, living on mission in our world. You see a little bit of a story there. I think the first draft of this had my cell phone number in there, and I love all you guys, but I thought, wow, that might be a little too personal, you know. Maybe we'll put the Instagram on there, or, or the email. You know, so there's a story. And then as you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you may see that we've been talking about our, our, our values. What do we value? What, what, what's our heartbeat? And, and then that's what drives being a community that lives new life. That's what drives being a community that loves God. That's what drives being a community that connects together. And that's what drives being a community that lives on mission. So lastly, today is the day where you've got to put your brain on. You say, what? Last couple of weeks I've had to put my brain on. Well, all that stuff sounds great. But how do you do it? How do you get there? Do you borrow the CEO, CFO, COO model that works in business? Yes, you can. You can do that. It is a way. But was it the first way? I would say no. If you've ever read the Bible or ever even peeked at church history a bit, the first century model was independent, autonomous, collaborative house churches under qualified leadership. That was the way. Things adapt, things change. If you've ever read a history book, you know why we have buildings and so many other things. Does that mean buildings are wrong? No, we like them when they're not flooded, right? Like, we appreciate them. We need them. Don't you need a building to house yourself in? Some people don't. They buy these things called sprinter vans, and it's amazing. They, like, just take off around the world. And 
I'm getting to know that world a little bit. But buildings is not the issue. Community is. That's what a church is. But it, to have a community in a building, there is nothing wrong with that. And having a community in a nice building, nothing wrong with that. But will everyone fit in this building? No. Will everyone come to this building? No. So we should just stop and let it be us four and no more and build a Christian country club, right? No, we can't. That's not our job. That's not our job. So here's what I'd like to do today as simply as I possibly can. I would like to ask three questions. Here they are. What was Jesus like? Secondarily. But what was he like? That'll make sense in a moment. And then number three. What has Jesus called you to do? What was Jesus like? No, 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 no. Tell me what he was really like. And then number three, what has he called you? Not your spouse, not your mom, not your dad, not your aunt, not your uncle. You to do. He has called you to do something. And today, I would like to take as little bit of your time as possible to share what I believe he's called you to do. In the principle, and then you have to work out the practical, right? Right? Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be together in Jesus' name. Not to gather together under the name of a sports team. Not to gather together in the name of an organization or a business or a personality or a philosophy or a program. But Lord, we gather this morning under the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room and watching online with us this morning or listening at a later time. God, that you would diffuse distractions and you would speak clearly. God, that you would help me. I, I'm one who needs much of it. And I pray that you'd help me to serve you by serving your people well. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. What was Jesus like? Well... Jesus had purpose. You say, what do you mean? Let me read to you from the New Living Translation, a classic verse, but don't let the classic steal the impact. Jesus said, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son. Have you ever sent a letter, ever sent an email, ever sent a text? That, does, that kind of insinuates purpose. God sent his son into the world to judge it because they didn't vote according to his political party. No. God sent his son into the world not to judge, but to save the world through him. What was Jesus like? Jesus had purpose. Jesus says, I have been sent so that they, and I'm a they, you're a they, we're a they, we're all they, may experience new life. Okay, but here's the question though. Second one, don't you love this message? I'm already to point two. You got, wow, this is great. But what was he really like? Philippians chapter two tells you not just his purpose, but a little bit of his personality, a little bit of his aura, a little bit of his ethos, a little bit of his dynamic. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, the author named Saul, who changed his name to Paul, wrote this. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Oh my goodness, you're about to learn the attitude of Jesus right here in the Bible. Here it is. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God was something to cling to. Have you ever met someone who thought they were God? I have. That they're God's gift. You ever met that person? 
And they're clinging to that. That's what they're all about. Jesus wasn't like that. You know what? He actually was God. And to him, it was no thing but a chicken wing, right? Like he didn't care. You say, what do you mean? Instead, what did he do? Verse 7. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. And he even died a criminal's death. Not a lot of honor there. Jesus took the low road. Do you? Do I? Listen, Jesus had it all. Power, prestige, resource. He told Lucifer, listen, if I wanted to call angels down from heaven to get whatever done I want done, it'll happen. Anyone ever had that many employees who could say, like, hey, whatever I need, it's done. I've got more resource than you even know exists. Is that what Jesus did? He had it all. He was God's gift. But he did not live for himself. Can you say that about yourself as a mini Christ? That is what a Christian is. A, a mini Christ. You're like, you're like the exact representation of Jesus. So that would mean that your attitude is, as God gives to me, I don't hoard it. I give it away. If not, then let's just be honest. My encouragement is let's know and live like Jesus. How do we do that? Well, here's the second question. Or third, actually. What has he called us to? I'll just read this to you. It's found in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus says this. If anyone wants to be my follower, you need to get a big social media following. No, he doesn't say that. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own platform. What? That's not the way of the world. You build a platform. No, Luke, 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 Luke 9, 23. If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and you follow me. Doesn't that fly in the face of everything we're trying to say on social media? Follow me, follow me, follow me. No, no, no. No, we're supposed to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. You'll actually find it. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 5. Is he speaking about us, you and me, right here? Listen to what he says. Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You know what you do, Christians? In culture, in fashion, in banking, in plumbing, in candlestick making, in politics, in church, in athletics, you keep the world savory. You give it taste. You're the salt of the earth. But he asks a question. What good is salt if it's lost its flavor? What if salt forgot its purpose? Can you make it salty again? Will it be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless? You're the light of the world. That's who the church is. Like a, a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Like sometimes when I get up early, I don't have my phone on me, but my watch does it too. You know the flashlight app? And it's dark out there. And I need to go, know where to go, either to the, grab a cup of water or step outside or to the bathroom or whatever it is. I don't turn on the light and then go, okay, now I've got to find my way. No, I let the light shine in the darkness so I know where to go. He said, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Last scripture, Matthew chapter 28. What, what, what has Jesus called us, to, called us to? He said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Here's your purpose. It's just like his from John chapter 3. Go and make disciples. Isn't that bizarre that he didn't say go and make that money? 
Go and fulfill your dream. Go and build the bigger and better mousetrap, whatever it is. No, he said, go and make l- learners of me. That's what a disciple is. And where do I do it? I just do it where I'm comfortable. Where I'm just about home team. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Last week, Pastor John shared something so insightful about God's plan. He said one of the healthiest ways to reach a community is to plant a church. Businesses are great. Government officials will help. But November 3rd won't make America great again. You will. You're the church. Stop looking to another to do the job that you're called to do. You're called to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes, we should vote for candidates. Yes, we should serve in our community. Yes, we should run our businesses with integrity. Yes, we should parent our children and train them and stop seeking to entertain them. But can you imagine if everyone did that? I think it would make the world great again. And it's not about a guy like me. The pastor is the guy to just come alongside the true ministers and say, you can do this. This is who you are. Go for it as a business owner, as an independent contractor for the military, as a school teacher, as a retired school teacher. As a pastor in transition, whatever the, whoever's sitting here, go for it. You're not dead. God has purpose for you. Live life to the fullest. And here comes the question. How do I do that? That's right here. This is how you do this. You say, what do you mean? Can it be that simple? It can be if you wade through a lot of dynamics to make it simple. Here's what I think you do. I think you love God. Well, sure, I do that. Okay, but can we put a little bit of strategy to that? What do you mean by that? Well, is it more than just maybe you, the Bible, and a beer, and the beach, and Jesus? Could it be a little bit more than that? Like that's church with your buddies? I think it's a lot more than that. I I love this resource, and I've shared this with you when we opened up this sermon series this pastor interviewed, you know, a handful of pastors, and he said this, a few billion people worship Jesus as God every week and do so in the church, yet if you walk into various churches and ask the people who comprise the church what the word church means, the odds are you'll either get a blank stare or a series of conflicted definitions. And he said, sadly, this is even true of their pastors. In preparing for this book, I asked various pastors of some of America's largest churches, godly and good men and dear friends, if they have a working definition for the church, and they confessed that not one of them did. They were giving their lives to building something for them they could not clearly define. Maybe there was a fuzziness, but not clearly. You know, right now we're talking about repairing these buildings. And when you talk to structural engineers and architects and all these guys, they don't speak in fuzziness. You know what I mean? Like, they have a blueprint. <laughs> They're like, this is where this is going to go. You don't go over there and say, well, couldn't we just kind of get started and just see what happens? I'll tell you what will happen. <laughs> It'll cost you a lot more time, a lot more money, and a lot of frustration, and a lot of trail of dead bodies behind you to get it up. So if we apply that to physical buildings, why not apply that to spiritual? What do you mean? That perhaps God has a strategy. Is it your strategy, Neil? No, I'm not that smart. If you've ever met me and talked to me for five minutes, you go, that guy, he left it all on the table in that sermon. There's nothing left there, right? Like, no, I I, I think there's a way. It's those 10 values, those 10 values that are in your magazine. So when we gather together on a Sunday morning, the first day of the week, we just live those values. Say, what do you mean? We gather together to sit in rows. This is intentional, the rows. It's not circles for a reason. This is monologue for a reason. 
we sit in a, in a row and we sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word. We, we collaboratively and collectively sing together. We serve one another. We give towards the work of God. We pray together. We fellowship together. Every third Sunday, we take communion together. Next Sunday, we'll baptize people together. And we do that for adults and students and children in an environment where it can be received. I've got five kids. I'm going to lay all my cards on the table. My wife wants two more. Can you believe that? Who is that lady? Two more after five? She made me buy this van that will like house them. Like, it's crazy. But I've, I understand that if, if Leo is right here, while well, I'm trying to tell him about Ecclesiastes chapter two for 40 minutes, you, me, and Leo are all like, what in the world? Like 40 minutes of Ecclesiastes? Like, he, he needs to be in an environment where he can really kind of hear God's word in an appropriate way. Students, I think the same thing, that there's a dynamic where environments are important. And same it is with us as adults. So we create an environment to worship and love and make church not about you. Can you believe that? That this isn't designed for you first? It's designed for him. And when your life is actually living what he says here, Oh, where does he say it? He says it here in Matthew chapter 5. He says it here in Philippians chapter 2. He says it here in Luke chapter 9. That when Christianity is not about nealianity, but Christianity, it comes alive. And you kind of forget that, man, the espresso's not here today. What, that donut's not from Breeze Donuts, it's from Walmart? I'm not coming back. Like, it diffuses self. And that's your biggest enemy. Self. You come to church to worship God, not receive a spiritual good. This is not a business. I'm sorry. The customer, he is always right, but you're not the customer. God is. And when we gather together, we get so much from him just by being around him and by being with his people. But if you think church exists for you, keep shopping. It'll never stop. It'll never stop. So then how do you grow? You see that green horizontal growth plan? Here's how you grow. You start with salvation. Every child wants to make dad happy. It's wired within them. Male and female yearns for the approval of father. Let me share something with you. You cannot do it with your heavenly father. You cannot, through your attitudes, actions, and choices, merit his approval. You can't. It's impossible. Another one had to do it for you. His biological, if I could say it that way, his spiritual, maybe not so much biological, don't take that out of context, his son, Jesus. You remember when he was baptized? What did he say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. You are designed to seek the approval of your parents. It's wired within you. Some of us fight it and we try and stuff it and then go, no, I'm not. I'm not. But you are. You are. And you know where you find it most? It's when you surrender your life to Jesus and say, Father, <laughs> I can be well pleased in your sight because of your son. It's not about my attitude. It's not about my actions. It's not about my choices. It's about the attitudes and actions and choices of Jesus. And that's what makes me satisfied in, satisfied in your sight. And I'm free. I'm forgiven. I'm made whole. I am no longer trying to fill the Grand Canyon of my heart. With salary, status, sex, substance, or some new situation. Because I have a Savior. And He has set me free. Some of you aren't there. You haven't really been filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. You're playing church. And you're still looking to fill this with salary, status, sex, 
substance or some new situation. We just move, I get that position, this thing comes together. No, it won't. A Savior fills the heart, not the other six S's. Salary, status, sex, substance, and situations are good things, not God things. And when you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it robs you of the design of the good thing. Fill this with the Savior. And then tell everyone you know about it. How? By being baptized. That's your second step. If you haven't been baptized, I would love for you to hit that connect desk. Not hit it literally, but go out there after this service and sign up for Sunday. It is your next step. If you confess Jesus is Lord, I firmly believe that your next process and growth is to make a public profession and to do that through baptism. What do you do next? I think you need to take some first steps. It's just an opinion. It's just the NIV here, Neil's interesting version. Like We call it growth track in 2020. We're going to call it first steps in 2021. And here's what you do. You discover a little bit about who the church is, his people, a little bit about this thing in salvation. It's just a simple little class for an hour, and we bring Breeze Donuts. Don't worry. And then the second class is called Discern. You say, what do you mean discern? Well, you discern a little bit about how God's gifted and wired you. You find out who you are. Maybe. Spiritually and in your personality. The third step is to develop. How do I develop? In a face-to-face meeting with one of our staff members. Who says, man, so you know Jesus? This is how God's wired you? I want to answer any questions you have. How can I come alongside you? How can I help you become who God's designed you to be? And then the fourth step, remember all these Ds, I'm weird, my kids, Lily, Lucy, Leo, Liam, I I have all these alliterations. The fourth one is to deploy. What do you mean deploy? Become who you're designed to be. Well, what am I designed to be? A servant leader. That's who God wants you to be. One who serves and leads his own house well. And once you get that down, then you can help others. You come to know the Lord through salvation. You tell everybody about it through baptism and you discover, discern, develop, and deploy into life. I'm going to be honest with you. Many of those leaning in in this moment have not yet done that. Maybe we've done it organically, but have we done it strategically? It's just an opinion, but I think it would be ever so helpful for you. In January, we'll have the next live version of that. But by the end of the spring, we want to have it online. So you can do it at any time. Right now, it's like, I know you want to do it, but we're not ready for you. Like, but we will be. We will be. But I want to encourage you to take those first steps. And then, what's the next step? Come to this worship gathering. Be constantly reminded of God's people and His goodness and His grace and serve and give and sing and learn and pray and fellowship and take communion. Because spiritual fitness is not a problem to solve, it's a tension to balance. And if you think, well, I went to church last week, what if you applied that to physical health? You would not be healthy. Spiritual health is a balancing act. It's not a problem to solve. So come to a worship gathering where you are in rows, sitting under the preaching and teaching of God's word and everything that's there, it says how we love. And then be in community. This is the next step. There's one, two, three, four, five. Is there six there? I don't know. However many there are. Connect group. You know what's so encouraging about connect groups at Coastline Calvary Chapel in Gulf Breeze? I got the report this morning. We started with around 153 people in connect group. We're, we just finished week four. You know how many people showed up last week? 167. I've got to be honest with you. I have never seen growth increase in the middle of a midweek gathering season it always decreases always it's not anyone's fault it's just the nature of it but you guys are doing something different you're showing up and you're bringing others i've never seen that before in the 20 years that i've worked in churches never it always goes like this but for some reason, it's going like this. That's weird. I wasn't part of my notes. I just uh, 
Learned that a few minutes ago. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Lastly, you join a serve team. Like if you want to grow spiritually, then this is the process. You're saved, you're baptized, you learn a little bit about the church and how you can plug in and you start to be in a community both in a row and a circle and you're actually serving. Like you're not just kind of doing it, but you're doing it. Now you're talking, Neil, like 52 weeks a year, 365 days a week? No, I'm not talking that. I'm talking like in the majority of your year. Like this is your MO. Like if someone were to say, tell me what David Cloditis is about. I'll tell you, he's saved, he's been baptized, he kind of knows how God's wired him, he comes to church, he's in a small group, and he serves people. Well, that guy's growing. Now, does he do it every week? Some weeks, no, he sleeps in. No, just teasing. Like, but, like, that's okay. Can anyone, like, do it intensely every single day? There was this one guy named Jesus, and he did it, man. <laughs> like, but other than that, we're all just filled by his spirit and letting him live his life through us. But take the pressure off. What if you looked at life in three seasons, right? Like kind of the spring, summer, and fall. And you said, you know what? Two out of three, I'm there, man. I'm there. Every Sunday in that season. And in connect group and serving. I think two out of three works. But without that kind of barometer, we're kind of like, well, how much do I get away with? Because that's me, right? I'm the pastor's kid. Remember that? Like, how much do I get away with here? Like, how much do I have to do? How much do we not? Yeah shoot for two out of three see what the lord does okay connecting how do we do that well it's a it's a small group environment for kids students and adults and you see all those different elements there but remember this message is about living on mission so here's how you live on mission in my opinion again you're getting neil's interesting version there may be five of you that come back after learning about what really goes on in this brain after you lead see all this I think it happens both organically and strategically. God's using you as a disciple who makes disciples. How? Well, in my opinion, through your daily life. Like that's first and foremost how this works. That you first and foremost as a Christian. Oh, you know what? This one's outdated. Let me grab another one. I think I've got one. We had like three versions of this. So Lucas, let me borrow yours. Yeah, see that one right there? You don't want that one. You throw that one away. Okay, thank you. Daily life. I think in your daily life, you are who you are. Secondarily, you need some training. How does that happen? Well, it's organic, but every once in a while. Did anyone ever see the marriage podcast that Pastor John and Lynn put together? Okay, Chad saw it. All these people are never going to stay married. They never. No, I'm just teasing, like... It was just this like little resource, this little tidbit. It wasn't like, okay, it's co- every week we're going to be. No, it's like, oh, it's kind of organic. It kind of just came together, and it's meant to be a resource to help. There's events. Like next Sunday, the um, whatever it's called, cookout. That's not just like, hey, let's just find something to do. It's actually meant to help you grow, like in community, in love with the Lord, and be encouraged. Come to that thing. If and when we have conferences. That's kind of what the women's tea is a little bit like. Like we bring in this special speaker. Yes, it's an event, but she's there to kind of share about living for the Lord during the time that we celebrate his birth. And then lastly, serving on mission trips. Like El Salvador, Haiti, Mexico. When those things pop up, they're designed to help you grow. Well, then how do I strategically grow? Now, this is the dream. If I could have your eyes, if I could, if I could have your attention just real quick. When you see everything in the orange, some of this is yet to come or may never come or we may not make it through the end of the day. Like, or like James, remember what he said? Like, as you make your plans, <laughs> say as the Lord leads. We don't know what's coming for us, right? Does anyone know what's coming for him? Okay, we're all on the same page. But we should occupy while we're here. Meaning, if the Lord tarries, let's build. If the Lord tarries, let's be fruitful and multiply. If the Lord tarries, let's serve him with all that we've got. And this is maybe how we could do that. You could start with a three-year-old. And that's where CCA has started. With little three-year-olds. There's 60-something kids right now at Coastline Christian Academy. Four of them are Spencers, which I think, they're not all mine. There's other Spencers in this neighborhood. But a school that teaches a child academically, and spiritually 
I think that's awesome. A friend of mine started this thing in San Diego 12 years ago called Calvary School Online. And it's kind of like what Liberty does, where they have an online platform for children, K through 12, to, to go to school online, just not on campus. Well, a friend of mine started this one called Calvary School Online, Jared Beck. We went to the same church together in Santa Barbara so long ago. And it's doing so well. And we're in conversations of potentially, now remember what this is, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes, I'm not saying this is going to happen, it will happen, we'll force it to happen. No, it's just a dream that maybe there may be an opportunity one day to have a school that does reach three-year-olds through 12th grade. But when you get to that 6th and 12th grade range, you have to adapt a little. A friend of mine is the headmaster of Rocky Bayou Christian School. He's been there for, oh, some time. And I was talking to him a couple of years ago. I said, how are things going here? He said, Neil, I got to be honest with you. A private school is a challenge. Oftentimes, you're in the red financially. He said, by God's grace, our 800 student campus in Niceville and our other campuses, we've been able to come together and not only get us in the place we're in the black financially, but we're adapting. We're learning that education has changed. You can't expect a family just to say, well, it's got to be on campus from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. every single day. No, families aren't there anymore. You have to think of it a little bit more of a hybrid model. We were able to offer some things on campus and some things online. And this is potentially the dream for Coastline School. Life skill training. The pastors are meeting right now every single Monday at 1130 to work through a 14-week curriculum. Nope, 12-week curriculum. We, 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 we took two weeks off. To make it three months. Or what if we had a discipleship training dynamic where a pastor or a staff member took, oh, three to five of us and walked us through how to live out these values? Tell me about the gospel. How do I know it and live it? Tell me about this idea of worshiping in my life. Will that impact my head, my heart, and my hands? What I do with my money? What I do with my sexuality? Yeah, the Bible has a lot to say about that. What if we did that in seven classes, and then in four classes, we did some life skill training? Say, what do you mean by that? Some people don't know how to change oil in the car. Some people don't know how to make a grocery list and stick to it. Can I get an amen to that to anybody? Like, okay. Some people don't know how to budget some people don't know how to care for themselves physically. What if we had some people who know how to do those things come alongside those that are interested and say, why don't we Luke 252 this? Why don't we grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man? Why don't we reach the whole person? Well, that's what the life skill training would be. Coastline College, well, what in the world is that? A friend of mine Chapin Marsh is the headmaster of Calvary Chapel University. I've been speaking with him over the last three months in prayer and in dream of discussing an opportunity to provide audit, certification, and degreed training through Calvary Chapel University here. So that when the Lord opens doors, for the coastline to be reached, we're ready. We can send that worship leader. We can send that kids director. We can send that student director. We can send that admin person, that communications person, that pastor and his wife. We can send them in teams. Church planting alone is lonely. It doesn't have to be. There's another way. If you have a leadership development pipeline that is both organic and strategic. And then ministry training. What in the world is that? You ever heard of interns? Like what if you came on staff as a, a PI or an AI? Say, what is that? A pastor in training or an assistant in training? I say, well, how do I be involved in all this? I have no stinking idea because I'm not you. I know what I'm supposed to do. I was supposed to tell you about this. That's all I know. Now I got to wait for God to give me more marching orders. Like, 
I was supposed to work on this and show it to you and basically ask this question. Would you pray about this? Would you process this with us? Would you understand that this isn't going to happen overnight? That this is going to probably happen over the next one year, five years, 20 years? Because you know who's in charge? The guy that hung on that cross. I'm not in charge. I'm just the messenger boy. I'm just telling you what he tells us to do and trying to say, oh, we're just trying to keep it from, from, uh, from exploding. But how do you live on mission? This is where we'll close. I'll go ahead and invite the band up now if I can. This is how we do it. We recognize that we're called to be just like Jesus. Pop quiz. Let's see who's still awake. The answer is yes or no. Jesus had a purpose. Yes? Okay. What was that purpose? New life. Read John chapter 3. What was his attitude like? Did he, did he hoard it all to himself? Remember Philippians chapter 2? He had it all, but he considered himself humble and became a servant. Listen, some of you have it all. What do you mean? You're talented. You're smart. You're capable. You're resourced. Who's the recipient of that? You and your dream or Jesus and his dream? Jesus' attitude was, I got it all, man, and I'm giving it away. I'm telling you, when you live like that, God gives you more than you could ever dream of. That's found in Luke chapter 9. And what did Jesus tell us to do? Go and have barbecues. No, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them teaching them organically and strategically I would say to observe all things that I've commanded and he says I am with you I don't know about you this freaks me out to say this is what you want me to do I can't do this that's why he reminds me of Matthew chapter 28 verse 20 I am with you Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Oh, so you got all the authority and you're going to stay with me? Okay, then I'll do it. As long as you promise to stay with me and as long as you promise to keep providing, I'll keep stepping out. But you've got to promise to provide. You've got to promise to be present. Because if you're not, this is just words on a page, man. This means nothing. Without God saying, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to do it with. This is where I want to do it. This is why. This is how. And when? Today is always the day of salvation. If you wait till tomorrow, your tomorrow may never come. What's so important today that's keeping you from doing this? From taking your next step? Is it SMP? Sex, money, power? Is it salary, status, sex, substance, or situation that's keeping you from a savior? That stuff is sugar-coated poison apple, man. Let that go. Don't make a good thing a God thing. Let God, who is good, be your thing. And then you come alive. I know you're fearful. But you have a good shepherd who will care for and walk with you through the valleys and into green pastures. And he will be with you. The question is not, God, where are you moving? The question is this. God is saying, I'm moving. Will you join me? And you may say, I don't know how. That's a lie. I just told you how. <laughs> I just gave you the steps. So here's the problem now, man. You're responsible. I'm done. Like, I, I feel like, okay, it's, it's communicated. I don't, I, the Holy Spirit convicts, not me. I'm not going to be here. So what's your next step? Let's see. Where you, that's not my job. I'm the messenger boy. Hey, do, yeah, here's your steps. We're going to help you along the way as much as we possibly can. Most of us will do the green. Man. That's awesome. Stay in the green. That's a killer place to live. 
Don't look at this as levels, like, oh, well, they're up there. No, this is horizontal. This is not vertical. Doing this doesn't make you better than the next guy. You just need to discern what God's called you to do and take your next step. And remember, this is a balancing thing, not a solving thing. You say, what do you mean? You don't go to a worship gathering once and go, I did it, man. Now I can just go do whatever I want on a Sunday. No, it's like this rhythm. It's this rhythm. So here's where I'm going to leave you. By God's grace, we ended on time. Thank the Lord. There's a connect card in front of you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to say what? P, P, P. What do you mean? Pray, process, or partner. And here's what I am going to ask of you. I'm going to ask you to take a connect card. You can do it now if you want. You can do it while we're singing or right when we close. And write your name down. If you say, man, I've been coming here. They know my contact information. Then great. We don't need all that. But you're first and last. And say, you know where I'm at? I'm praying. You know where I'm at? I'm processing. That's cool. Process that, man. Read, observe, watch. That's what we've been doing over the last four weeks. Read, observe, watch. Read, observe, watch. Read, observe, watch. If you need more time to read, observe, and watch, this is where it came from. Read. Read, 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 read. Observe and watch, watch, see if this is true. But eventually you have to make a decision. You can't row forever. Or partner, I want in. I want to be on this team. I want to live new life. I want to live in love. I want to live connected. I want to live on mission. Cool. At least now we're on the same page. Or we're not. And that's cool too, because you know what I've got? I've got family, I've got friends, and then I've got frenemies. Say, what do you mean by that? No one's my enemy. I love, I love that nobody. There's victims of the enemy. There's people that don't like me, and they're kind of my frenemies, but I do everything I can to like, get them to like me, but for some reason, it doesn't always work out. But you're either my, really, you're, you're family or friend. I don't really want you to be my frenemy. It was just a joke, you know, but like. But we have one enemy, right? Amen. His name is Satan. Oh, no, you don't know that? You, like, this guy's not your enemy? We have one enemy, amen? amen? Satan. No flesh or blood is your enemy. The enemy would like you to think so. But there's only one. So as we close today, Tabitha will be at the Connect desk. I'm just going to ask you to leave your card with her or drop it in one of those offering boxes. Because we want to pray for you. I'm not just asking, oh, here's our analytics, let's see. No, it's, it's like this. If you're saying, I'm praying, cool, we want to pray with you. I'm processing, cool, we're going to pray with you as you process. I'm ready to partner, uh-oh, what does that mean? That means we've got to do something. Like, I don't know, give us a second <laughs> to figure out what our next step is. I, I know what it is, I'm just teasing. But I am calling you to a response. I know that's a lot to ask, but I'm calling you out to say, I'm going to pray going to process, I'm going to partner, and I'm not going to throw this away. I'm going to take this home and, man, pray about it, consider it, and take your next step. If it's baptism, we'd love to baptize you on Sunday. If it's a worship gathering, that includes not just sitting, but serving and giving and learning. It's on the back there. It tells you about that. You know what I'm saying. I don't need to say anything more. Let me just say this last thing. God loves you. He has a wonderful, 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 wonderful plan for who you are and who you are yet to be. Take steps with him. Don't sit on the sidelines. Enjoy your life. Live fully in love. Live in community. Live on purpose. In my little opinion, here's some steps to take. There's probably more and there's probably better ways to say it. but I want you to see, I want to see you do well. That's the heart of a pastor. I want to see you do well and enjoy every season of your life. You don't have to live alone. You don't have to live isolated and you don't have to live purposeless. You can dream, you can dream and allow God to make those dreams his and to fulfill them. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for each person seated in this room, watching online, or perhaps listening at a later time. I pray and ask, Lord, that as they begin to think through their next step of prayer or process or partner, 
that God, you would speak to their hearts. You'd use them to glorify your son by your spirit and that our lives would be living sacrifices lived unto you. We pray as we close out this time together, God, that you would be glorified and honored. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a chorus, and then in a minute we're going to give a benediction, but continue to let this marinate as we sing.